Hi everybody, this is Britta and this is, um, I can't remember, some episode of, of the um, Getting to the Core podcast. I think it's probably number eight. And, um, and uh, this is Ask Me Anything about presence and mindfulness. So to start us off, why don't we actually start with a little presencing exercise? So just if you are not driving or not doing anything, just sit, find a comfortable position. If you are doing something like some people listen to this when they are um, running, some people when they're doing dishes or something. So my, my invitation for you is to just make this more mindful, whatever you're doing right now, if you are listening to this while you're doing the dishes or while you're running, just become mindful of what's happening and what are the sensations that you are aware of. And if you have a moment where you can actually stop and sit, just take that moment right now and just with me, just close your eyes. And just take a few deep breaths. So once your body is settled into a comfortable position, just see if you can, you know, in and out through the mouth. Just take a few deep breaths into your lower belly. And just see if for a few moments, you can actually just be present with the sensation of the breath in your belly. So your belly should inflate as you're breathing in so kind of push into your hands and as you're breathing out your belly would deflate come closer to your spine yeah just stay with that for a few moments And if your mind wanders off, just bring it back. If you're doing an activity right now while you're listening, just you can also pay attention to your breath or to the sensations that are present as you're doing this activity. If you can, maybe even slow this activity down a bit. And just see how many breaths you can actually stay with your attention right there on your breath and nowhere else. Just noticing the sensations of breathing in and breathing out. You know, many of us, it's one, two, three breath. And then we're off somewhere, right? So, and so the first thing I just want to say about this is is totally normal. So don't think that you don't know how to be present or how to be mindful. Um, it's really about what we do when we get distracted. So for this super simple exercise of just breathing into the lower belly. Just noticing when the thoughts come in and want to take you somewhere and then just gently bring yourself back. And in a certain sense, that's all I really need to say here for this Ask Me Anything, um, that, you know, presence, mindfulness is a lot about where you put your attention and how you bring yourself back when you lose your focus, your attention. Um, and then we have some questions here. <clears throat> so um, let's see, I'm going to start with someone's question about, um, this is actually good, this is for the ones of you that have already practiced mindfulness and um, presence and have an, have your attention on it and want to be more present. So here's a question. As I practice more mindfulness and awareness of my present experience, I notice just how much my mind is always at work. 
and how often I'm doing one thing but thinking about five other things. Anyone can relate to this? <laughs> um, I know it's not that I'm more distracted than I was before, but just that I've come more aware of it. Great insight, yeah? Any advice on how to approach when more mindfulness means we're more mindful of not being present? Um, so that's a great question. So a few things about that. Yes, that is definitely what happens when we are more aware, when we're more present, when we're more mindful. That is something we will notice, that how much we're thinking. So another thing I just want to say about that is like there's nothing wrong with thinking. I really want you to hear this because people think being mindful or being present means you have no thoughts. And I tend to disagree with mm -hmm. that. It's not about that. It's about um, becoming aware of the thoughts and not jumping on the train of the thoughts. If what we're doing is, let's for example, we want to pay attention to the breath or we want to pay attention to being present with another human being. You know, they're talking to us and we want to mindfully listen. Or we want, we're doing something, we're working on something, and we really want to be present with that project and not think about a million other things because we know that's how we're more efficient, right? So any of those situations, you know, because mindfulness and presence is not just about when we're on our meditation pillow, but it really is about all day. Yeah, that's another misconception that mindfulness is meditation. And then so we meditate for this little bit of time and then the rest of the time we just go on with our day. It's really meant to be brought into every moment of our everyday life. So, for example, I just became aware of my hands folding, right, just as I was talking to you. and my breath in my belly and my belly feels a little tight you know and I notice when I breathe in there's a little tightness in my body in my lower belly and it feels full because I just had lunch so just that little bit of physical sensation and, and becoming aware of my physical sensations just brought me a little bit more present with you here on this Facebook life thing <laughs> So, uh, so, so first of all, it's normal that we're thinking. The mind is made to produce thoughts, just like our heart is made to produce heartbeats. So it will think, and thoughts just arise out of nowhere. Yeah, you're not like you're not choosing to think about five other things when you're doing one thing. They just come. Yeah, so. First of all, it's not about repressing those thoughts or making those thoughts wrong or making yourself wrong for thinking so much. Um, but it's more about, okay, noticing the thoughts and then simply letting them go. So if I want to concentrate on, let's say here on my... <laughs> this is distracting these little, <laughs> these little uh, emojis in the bottom. So if I... If I don't want to concentrate on the emojis, but actually want to concentrate on what I'm talking about, that's a choice that I can make, right? I have to say, okay, I want to, I'm focusing, I'm training my mind to be with the theme here. Yeah. So um, this is a good example. So it's some, it's more about where you put your attention and then practicing that over and over again. And for that, meditation is awesome. So these 20, 30, 40 minutes that you spend on the pillow is like a training ground. You know, in the beginning, when we start a meditation practice, it's often just about like training the mind to focus on something. That's why people, most traditions focus on the breath because it's always with us. and and it's also rhythmic and it's moving, so it's easy to pay attention to. Easier than something still. Yeah, it's like it goes in and out and it's moving and we can count the breath or we can sense the sensation of the breath or we can label the breath, you know, in breath, out breath, you know. So 
that's all, that all helps, you know, so it's a way of training the mind. And we can do the same with when we're during the day, when we're in some activity and we want to focus on one thing and then other thoughts come. Yeah, we can just simply label these thoughts. So if you're thinking something, if you're planning something in the future, you can label it planning and then just let it go and come back to the task at hand. Yeah, we can practice this really also during the day. We don't have to only do it on the pillow. So, um, yeah, so first of all, to normalize your experience, uh, and this was from Leah, by the way, so first of all, to normalize your experience, Leah. Second of all, to... Um, you know, last month, I believe it was my last month was a month of compassion, right? So bringing compassion to the distractions, yeah, to be gentle with the distractions and and just acknowledging your willingness to be present, yeah, and and then maybe labeling the thoughts, having some distance to them and going, planning, I'm planning right now. And then just simply coming back to where you were or where you wanted to put your attention. And uh, and more compassion. Compassion, you know, I know that was last month's theme, but I'm going to bring this through um, every month because it is so important for us to not make ourselves wrong. Because when we notice the thoughts and then make ourselves wrong for thinking so much, then we're really caught in thoughts. Yeah, and then we're really, really can get lost in more, more distraction, yeah? So instead of that just going, oops, I'm planning again, or I'm worrying again, <laughs> or, you know, like labeling that and just going bye-bye to that thought and just coming back, yeah? So I hope that was helpful. So let's go to another question. Um, as I practice more mindfulness and presence, I have noticed that I seem to be much more sensitive to my surroundings, in particular to my interactions with people. The most common experience is around active listening. So I just want to say what active listening is. It's mindful listening that where you're listening to another person and you really want to get into the land of the other and you shut your own opinions and own stories and own beliefs you just kind of put that aside and just be with the other person that is um that is one of the uh, qualities of active listening yeah so true listening deep listening I have truly enjoyed the power and compassion with this practice and can see others soften and receive the gifts of someone who just listens. However, because active listening is not a common practice, I notice my sensitivity when it is me who is doing the sharing. Typical to many interactions, I notice the other ready to advise and respond rather than just listen. Again, can anybody relate to this? <laughs> this is the normal way that we listen to one another. With We're like ready to pounce on the other person and tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, I continue here. I then notice myself go right into my head with thoughts of saying, yeah, but you didn't get me. And I notice my body tense up. So I'm going to stop here for a moment. That's awesome. Um, that's awesome because that's mindfulness right then and there. So you notice the thoughts that are arising, you notice the physical sensations, yeah? And perfect. I keep going. The inner dialogue that I have is an understanding that active listening isn't common, so this person doesn't realize they're not helping. And understanding that said person also is trying to help, that that person is trying to help. They don't mean harm, so I should just respond graciously. However, inside I'm feeling disconnected and obligated to accept the advice with a fake smile and a nod of my head. Do you have any thoughts on this? Advice on easing this common interaction without making anyone wrong? What a great question again. Um, 
So first of all, acknowledge yourself for the self-awareness you have, because that, again, mindfulness and presence is not about changing the experience. This is another thing that's really important. We're not changing anything and it has no agenda <laughs> in other than to be with what is very difficult for us right it's like what that's it but in a certain sense that is it just to be to lean into the present experience so here i am i have this beautiful intention to actively listen to someone else and then they give me advice and i don't like it right it's like my body tenses up my thoughts come online you know and um <laughs> here's my all standard answer compassion <laughs> you know like that's also normal nobody likes to be given advice unless we specifically ask for it yeah it's it's just unpleasant to get advice when we don't want to be um receiving advice so my advice <laughs> would be to all of you listening just to just to kind of internalize that that people don't like to be given advice um so to refrain from it you know and then when you're getting advice and you haven't asked for it to be compassionate with yourself if you don't like it um this is a bit of a tangent but we basically only really receive advice or support when we've asked for it when we when we're open to it when what we call in at core we call that the healthy self um so the part of us that is present mindful compassionate wise you know like um when that part says yes i want help i want support i want your advice then we're ready to actually receive it if we haven't asked for it or are no requests from it internally we're that's just going to activate our survivor self um which in core that's the part of us that's called sort of our regular mo <laughs> you know like the way we we act in the world without um whether when we're unconscious when we're not mindful when we're not present we're basically stuck in our defenses and our survival strategies and that gets really activated when we receive advice without asking for it or when we don't want any advice and we get it yeah so which is sounds like that's what happens for you um you get your body tenses up and gets into uh, gets a little bit of uh, right and um and the thoughts come in you don't get me you don't you know so that's those are good signs that the defenses get activated you know so then um which first of all again is completely normal and i just wanted to um follow up on uh i think it was leah who said yeah that normalizing piece especially that's helpful just to know this is common humanity when we don't want advice and we get advised we react yeah so um common humanity and um so first of all to know that second of all be compassionate with yourself oh i'm getting defensive and third of all um just noticing it like you said noticing we don't have to act on that just because we're getting tense so we're having these thoughts yeah so there's many options in that situation the the most passive option is to just be with your physical sensation and continue to listen yeah just be with attention in the belly and the thoughts and come back if you really really want to just keep listening keep listening and then you just let that go you know maybe tend to that later or you could of course um tell the person you said you know um would you be willing not to give me any advice you know like like i'm not really open to this right now that is a more active solution right where um you can say it in a gentle way, like I'm noticing I'm feeling a bit tense, you know, like and uncomfortable. Would you be willing not to advise me right now? You know, I just would like, you know, just to have a conversation with you. Then we just listen to one another. Risky, right? Very risky and more vulnerable. And you could get all sorts of responses <laughs> over there from it, you know. So, but it is a that's like an engaging question and engaging and non-defended. It's just speaking what is so for you and making a request of the other person. You know, that's another way. Or um, another way would be if you notice this comes up for you a lot, 
that might need, this might be one of those unresolved human experiences that need your attention, you know, that it's something you could work with, you could inquire into, like, why do I get so defended when somebody gives me advice? What is this, what is this stirring up in me? You know, and you could just inquire into, with compassion and kindness for yourself, like, what does this bring up? And that does that part need something, you know? Like, um, because have, now that I've said that, we usually get defended when we get given advice. If we're really present and fully, like, fully aware, fully in, in our healthy self and listen and somebody gives us advice, then we can just we can just go oh that's that's advice that doesn't really either it lands for me what they're saying or it doesn't land for me you know like in either way i'll either take the advice or i don't take the advice but there wouldn't be a trigger inside so it's triggering something inside of me yeah probably feelings of childhood feelings of you know parental stuff or being made wrong or feeling not seen or all sorts of things could come up in that situation yes it might be a time to tend to this you know so those are three different options um i would say to that so let's see what we've got here helpful Yes, Danny, you get that, but people don't like to be given advice. Uh, and I just want to say, I love to give advice. <laughs> That's why I'm on this, ask me anything. So, and I, I, I started coaching people when I was five or something, and I always told people what I think they should do. So um, you could always make a profession out of it. <laughs> so, um, so for me, I really had to learn to to curb that you know like to really feel into does a person actually want this and so lucky on the ask me anything if the person asked me a question then they wanted to be answered so that's a good thing you know but it is very human yeah um and that's true jen what you're saying if we become more tuned in uh, and intuitive then we can sense more is the person a request for something are they asking me something and I can also ask the person do you want my input on this do you want some feedback on this are you open to feedback to this that's a really great question to ask yeah if you like jumping at the bits to give advice yeah um, So there's a question from uh, someone. I'm not going to say the names right now um, to keep confidentiality, but there's a mom here that says, can I ask for advice? How can I help my six-year-old daughter come to a compassionate and accepting place around the fact that her father has severed his relationship with her? Right now, she's blaming herself and blaming me. She keeps asking me why, and she's not sure, and I'm not, and I'm, He's not sure what to say to her. So um, this is a very difficult situation. And um, very, again, compassion, compassion, compassion. Um, uh, obviously, like it's a, to talk to a child about anything is a different, you know, is different than to talk to uh, an adult. And you gotta take this, uh, take this to a child level, you know? Like I, I think the basic teaching for a child is, um, these principles, these simple principles of not place, placing blame on herself or you, um, you know, like that it's not, it's nobody's fault. Yeah. If children always fault themselves and um, in a divorce or in a separation where parents are separated, they often side with one side or the other. And that whole situation is very painful. Um, so the first thing is just to, assure her that it's not either one of your faults and um and then i would say to get help you know this is such a deep issue this is such a profound issue and and so 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 important that i would definitely get help professional help from um family family therapist um uh organizations have worked with families like here in Marin we have an organization that's called Apple and they work with families um, 
they work on sliding scales. They like work with families exactly around this issue, like how to talk to children and what to do. And this happens, you know, separation, parents separated and what to do in all these different situations is a very common problem. And there's, and there's people that really know how to deal with it. So I would definitely get help. This goes beyond mindfulness and pra and, and um, presence, you know, though it's very important to address this. That's, that's what I would say to that. Yeah. And um, my heart goes out to you. Compassion, compassion. Yeah. Um, Mina, you're asking, would judgment be treated in the same way? Can you say a little bit more about that, Lina? Um, judgment when you're judging somebody or when somebody judges you? Maybe I'll just go with both <laughs> scenarios. Um, so when somebody, when you are judging and you're noticing that, when you're noticing that you're judging someone, um, uh, First of all, is to not act on that. So here's another little teaching that I like to give. It's about stoic, the stoic and the addict, right? So the stoic response to things is, and they're both parts of, of the survivor self, right? Is to suppress it. So I notice that I'm judging and I don't like it. So I try to suppress it, right? Um, the addict acts out on this and just blurs the judgments out on the person, right? Um, both of these ways don't work, <laughs> yeah? Judgment is just like anything mental, is a mental thing, right? And, it's, and it's, um, it's a function of the mind. It's a very normal function of the mind. You're spewing out judgments all the time about what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what I should do, what I shouldn't do, what somebody else should do or shouldn't do. Um, that's just what the mind does, yeah? Um, and it's different than discernment. Discernment comes from the healthy self. And there's a, how we can discern that is um, judgment always has an energy of it, of kind of like, uh, there's a grip to it. There's like a, there's like an attachment to it that feels tight. In in internally, there's a tension, yeah? Discernment feels more open, yeah? So that's one way to distinguish them. And there's not such a stronghold on them. So um, we don't want to suppress the judgment and make it wrong. And we don't want to act out on it. We're, again, we just want to be present. Okay, how does this feel in my body? Like often when I judge, I've got like, I have like a tight jaw, you know, and my shoulders get tight and I'm, I'm always going to form fists, you know, like I'm ready to fight. It's a fight thing from from my personality so so i um i just breathe i notice that i'm judging i breathe into it and i notice the sensations in the body and i bring kindness like obviously something just got triggered in me this is very good to know when i'm judging somebody or something and i have all this charge with it i'm triggered it's something i need that i'm not getting in that moment and and I can engage into an inquiry. I try not to, I attempt not to actually act on that when I notice how tight I am. Because every time I do, uh, it just comes back, the other person comes back with their judgment. And then we get into an ego situation, which isn't helpful. So my practice is not to spew the judgments out that I have, yeah, into practice mindfulness, practice compassion, inquiry again about what's coming, what's triggered in me that this judgment is coming up, yeah? Um, or when I do spew it out, <laughs> because I'm, I'm not always catching it, I apologize and I say, okay, let me start again. Like that's my practice with Lee, for example, my husband is like, I, I catch myself and I go, you know what? That was judgmental. And um, I just want to reel that back. I'm sorry. And here's what's coming up for me. I take it to myself. Yeah. So that's when um, um, that's when I judge. When judgment comes to me, you know, this is not that different, actually. I also don't want to, I don't want to suppress my 
reaction to it or make it wrong and i don't so usually i don't like it when i get judged right or like it's hard or ugh, you know depending on how hard harsh the judgment is it can really like get in right and uh, i i attempt not to um suppress that and i also um don't act out on it acting out usually looks like either I'm imploding, you know, and taking that judgment of the other person and make myself wrong, or I explode and fight with the other person, right, and defend myself. So either of those don't work either. And then the best way that I found to deal with this is, again, noticing what's coming up for me, bringing compassion and mindfulness to the sensations. This is all about sensations, right? And um, breathe. And if I have a trusting relationship with the person, I would share that. I would say, you know, when you, when you just said that I felt <sighs> tight in my chest or, you know, I notice I'm getting defensive, you know, my jaw is tight or whatever I'm noticing. And would you be willing to say this in another way that I can hear this? Because this is really hard for me to hear like this, you know, so... This is when I catch myself, right? When I don't catch myself, again, it's not like we only have one shot at being mindful and then if we don't get it, then uh, we're screwed, right? Like we can always apologize and start again. Yeah, because the present moment always presents itself again. And as soon as we become aware or present or mindful to what just happened, we can, we can name it, step back and go, okay, let's have a new beginning. Remember that was our... January theme, new beginnings. We always have new beginnings. Yeah, we don't have to keep going with that. So um, I hope that's helpful with the um, with that question. Um, yeah. So you know, just to go to the very end of your comment here, with a fake smile and the nod of your head. So um, that's also something to notice that the fake smile like you know when you really don't feel like smiling and and uh you know just to be again gentle with yourself if that happens and then make another choice when you notice that you're inauthentic you know making another choice one of those choices that we just talked about okay quickly to yuki you say i'm curious in response to your comment about children always blaming themselves when parents split why do children typically blame themselves during trauma or divorce um, another really deep question, and I don't know if I can do it justice, but um, I think it's because when we're little, we have such a, you know, our egos are just developing and our separate identity, and we don't really think very far past ourselves, <laughs> you know, like, it's like, we're very self-referential when we're children, you know, like, it's like, um, so it's very difficult for us to fathom what exactly goes on in everybody else you know what goes on in the grown-ups and what what are they experiencing to put ourselves in their shoes and um so it's natural to to go oh it must be my fault like mommy and daddy are not getting along like uh is that because of me like did i do something it's, it seems to be it just seems to be how we're wired um as children and Probably a child psychologist could explain this much better, but that's that seems to be what's what's happening that our little egos are forming in our own personalities, and it's natural, easy to just make everything about us and as we're moving as we're growing up and we're becoming we're more aware of the field and everybody else and more empathetic and more understanding cognitively understanding of what's going on and that not everything is about us um then we're learning that if somebody else is mad that doesn't necessarily even mad at us it doesn't mean it's about me you know but that's a that's a that's even for a lot of adults difficult to learn that not everything that's going on is about me, you know? So, um, and when we're little, that's very, that's that we're, we're just learning that we're making steps towards that. Yeah. So it's just, I just think it's important as parents to understand that that is often what children do, that they, that they blame themselves and uh, for, for parental difficulties and to, 
speak to them about that. And again, I would highly recommend getting professional help in a situation like that um, with people that know how to how to speak to children, how who understand children, and uh, someone that you trust, someone that got referred to you that you trust. And because this is a really delicate issue, and we want the hearts of our children to be well. Yeah. So I think that's it, darlings. I think I'm going to, um, I'm just going to answer one more quick question from uh, somebody who's a meditator and who basically says, um, he happens to practice centering prayer and he says, sometimes during meditation it happens uh, that my mind wanders off, but I go to some other state where I'm getting <clears throat> some sort of download. It's always quite valuable, providing me with insights or lessons that are precious gifts. And yet that is not the intent of the meditation. And I wonder about how is this affecting my developing the muscle of coming back to the present moment? What are your thoughts about this? Should I try to somehow separate the two activities and be strict with my meditation practice, but then also make a separate additional time for a receiving practice? Yes. <laughs> The answer is yes. Um, uh, you the, you want to use the meditation, whatever meditation practice you practice, um, in this case it was centering prayer, but it really doesn't matter what practice it is, whatever silent meditation practice you practice, you do not want to use that time for a time of getting downloads. Um, it's a time to practice presence and, you know, and um, train your mind or and or open, you know, to something greater, to a connection with something greater. And, and um, it's a time to practice coming back to the present moment, you know, and these downloads, however wonderful they are, um, they're kind of distracting, right? So, I would highly recommend um, sticking with the meditation practice. Um, if it gets really like you just can't, then write a few things down and um, then come back to the meditation practice, start over again. Yeah. Um, so that that little bit of time, which is only like often, you know, 20, 30 minutes, once or twice a day, is meant for this. And then. You can also use, like if you're looking for inspiration or downloads or something, um, you can also make a practice for that, you know, like where you're maybe first grounding and centering and breathing and then just opening to receive downloads, you know, like to that could be your other kind of practice or meditation, you know, or you um, dance or you start creative writing or some other process of getting these downloads, but I would keep them separate. And, um, you know, my meditation <laughs> teacher used to say, it doesn't matter what comes. Like if the Virgin Mary comes to you and gives you a download or whatever, just say thank you and come back to your practice. You know, like it's like it, it's like this is the time. And, and I remember him saying something, if this is a divine download and you're meant to get this, it'll be there after those 20 minutes or 30 minutes. It'll come again. Don't worry about it. So that would be my opinion. Now, other people might have a different opinion about this, but I really think this precious, this precious little time that we have to practice meditation, practice the um, method, whatever method you're doing. I'm also really against mixing different methods because they have different intents. Um, stick with one and stay with it and go through it for a while because the richness of that meditation practice will only come after, after practicing that particular one for a while. So that's it, darlings. Thank you so much for your beautiful questions. And thank you for joining me and sending you lots of love. Bye-bye.